Good. So we continue our series in the, in the book of Psalm. Please turn your Bible to Psalm 16. Psalm 16, and you will find on page 538, 538 in the Bible in the pew in front of you, 538. And the title of our sermon this morning is Joy and Security for Those Who Love God. Joy and Security for Those Who Love God. Several surveys have been conducted, conducted to determine what do people really and truly want in life. You could imagine the answer, the answer is, is happiness. Happiness consistently ranks as the number one popular want. One study even stated the question as follows. If you could say in one word what you want more of in life, what would that be? Again, the answer is happiness. In survey after survey, pleasure, happiness, joy. And all over centuries, men and women have sought happiness, pleasure of all kinds through several means, from smoking to drugs, from sex to professional success, and so on. And the world says, don't worry about anything at all. Focus on only getting ahead. Don't let anything get in your way. If necessary, step on the other fellow on the way up. And no problem if you have to be aggressive, selfish, or intimidating or mean. After all, life comes around once, and you have got to go to, for the top if you want to make it and be happy. This is what the world says. And even centuries ago, Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, argued that all people, without exception, seek happiness. And he said, this is the motive of every action of every person. Even, he said, of those who hung themselves. And the problem is people think that sin will bring lasting joy and pleasure. But sin always deceives. It delivers pleasure at first, as we see in Hebrews chapter 11, but quickly fades and turns to corruption. I wonder if I were to ask you to write the first word that pops into your mind when you think about God, what would that be? You would probably say, rules, not fun. Or would you write, joy, pleasure? And you should. And the Bible repeatedly teaches that full joy and lasting pleasure are found in only one place in the presence of God. And that's what we will see. Let me, gi let me give you some verses from the Bible that speak about finding joy and pleasure in the Lord. And let's uh, look at Psalm, Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34, you can uh, mark them down and then you will uh, look at them later. Psalm 34, verse 8 invites us, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 12, Moses commands, And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. In verse 18 in Deuteronomy 12, repeats it again, You shall rejoice before the Lord your God in everything you put your hand to. You see the, the verb rejoice and rejoice. And again in Deuteronomy 27, verse 27, in case you missed it, it says it again. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God. In the New Testament, from prison 
Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And so that you don't miss it, he repeats it again in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. And the Bible cho- shows us that the Holy, Sp- the Holy Spirit is the source of joy in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. So these are many and many more, ver- we have many more verses that invite us to find full joy and lasting pleasure in God. And this is what Psalm 16 is about. It's, it's about experiencing joy and pleasure in God. And if you look at verse 11 in Psalm 16, we read, In your presence is, full, is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. And the message of the psalm is simple. To have full joy and eternal pleasure. Make the crucified and risen Lord, Savior Jesus Christ, your highest and supreme treasure. And the psalm falls into two main sections. You have two main sections in the, in the psalm. Verses 1 to 6 describe how to make the Lord your supreme treasure, the first part. And the second part is from verses 7 to 11. And those verses show the results that follow if you put the Lord, Jesus Christ, as your supreme good and treasure. And, and what is, the, what is the, the result? The result is you will be satisfied with full joy and eternal pleasure in him. And uh, some commentators agree, they, they agree the, to say verses 8 to 11 speak prophetically about Christ, about his death and resurrection. Because both Peter and Paul cited and they quoted these verses in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 and 28, and about Christ, and that's why we will have a third uh, point in our sermon this morning, and which is that all of God's treasures are centered in death, in the death and resurrection of our, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's go to the text in verse 1. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. In other words, Protect me, preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. And keep watch over me. Is it an urgent prayer, an urgent prayer request of the psalmist? And from verses, and you, you will see that from verses 10 and 11, it becomes obvious that the psalmist is facing death. He requests life, but knows that even, the, even death will not separate him from God. And David trusted and took refuge in God. For in you, I take refuge. And the truth is, we all need a place of refuge and protection, both on this earth and eternally, and for eternity. We all need a a safe place. Probably it's your home, uh, in, on this earth, when you are at home, you feel safe. We all need that. We all need a place of safety. Temporally, we instinctively try to protect ourselves from harm and danger. We avoid the risk that could kill us. We wear seat belts when we drive, and please do during summer times as you travel. We avoid smoking and eating junk foods that that can cause disease. While we should do all these things, we also should take refuge in God to protect us. As I said, fasten your your seat belt, but pray for safety. Take proper care of your body, but pray for health. We need the Lord's protection constantly in this life. But far more than that, 
For more than temporal protection, we need an eternal place of refuge. And the fact is, we're all going to die. That's a fact. We, we are all going to die and stand before the holy God in judgment. All of us. How can we avoid condemnation on that day? All of good works you may accumulate will not erase the fact that you have sinned and that the wages of sin is death, is eternal separation from God. It's a fact. Your good works cannot make you right before the holy God. And if you are, let's say, if you are guilty of multiple murders, but you try to argue that in court that you are basically a good person and you devoted your, your free time to helping the needy, so, and you, you will still be convicted because you committed murder. And we all need a, a way to take care of our many sins before we stand before God. And the good news is God has provided Jesus Christ as the Savior for all sinners who put their trust in him. And this is the good news. This is the gospel. He is the refuge for God's wrath, for all who flee to him. And Jesus bore the curse of God's wrath that we deserve for our sins. And Paul said that in Romans, so that God could be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, as Paul said in Romans. And Paul wrote, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that promise is for you and me. Whoever who will call on the name of Jesus, of the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, will be saved. So to have full joy and eternal pleasure, flee now to Jesus Christ as your refuge and Savior. Then you will be safe on Judgment Day. And also let me suggest to you that to make the crucified and risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ your your refuge, your Savior, your Master. And this is the only way that you can save yourself on the judgment day. There is no other way. And as Peter said, there is only one name above the, 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 on this earth that you, you could be saved. It's only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's go to verse 2. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. You see, David finds contentment and sufficiency in Yahweh, and the word that he used, Yahweh. And he said, Yahweh is sufficient to all my needs. I have no good apart from you. And the psalmist of Psalm, if you look at Psalm 73, he makes a similar statement in response to the prosperity of the wicked. In Psalm 73, verse 25, he said, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. And the only way you can truthfully say that, that the Lord, Lord, you have no good besides you, I have no good besides you, is if you can affirm that. And the first part of verse 1, Lord, you are my Savior, you are my Lord. And just to give you some context, and David was part of, the, of a larger covenant people of God. You remember in Deuteronomy and, and uh, back in and First King, and uh, it, it was not enough. And what David is saying here, yes, I know that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm part of the larger covenant, covenant of God, but it's not enough. So in modern terms, just to, to give you an idea, in modern terms that you, you think that it's enough to be part of a Christian family, of a you know, member of, of a church, or, of, or you, you, you are a member of, uh, of, of any kind of church, but that can uh, 
help you to, to, to save yourself from, 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 from the judgment day. Uh, but he, he's saying, no, it's not that. And David is saying, I, I cannot count on that. And it's, for us today, what it means is, you need to have the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, your own personal savior. And you must personally be able to say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And only when you have Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can say, you can begin to say that, Lord, you are my highest treasure. And Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 13. If you look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 44, and Jesus said, he gave two parables in the kingdom of heaven, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man, a man found and hid again. And from joy and over it, um, over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that, that field. Again, the kingdom of God, of heaven, is like a merchant seeking fine pearls and upon finding on one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So what does that mean? That means being a Christian means that the Spirit of God has opened your eyes to see Jesus as that treasure in the field. He is the pearl of great value. And the joy of finding him makes it worth giving up everything else to gain Christ. And exactly what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of surprising value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Friends, have you done that? It's a very powerful statement from Paul. <coughs> Has God opened your eyes to, to see Jesus as your treasure and supreme good so that you have said, Jesus, you are my Lord. And that's the only path to lasting joy and pleasure. And Yahweh is David's only good. Yahweh is David's only Lord and Savior. And the idols of the nations are false. And David will say, will say that in verses 3 and 4. And he's saying the gracious, merciful, covenant God honors those who trust him and will live according to his covenant requirements. And the result is a life and afterlife of fellowship with God. Now let's go to verse 3. In verse 3 we read, As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. And the Hebrew word used for saints refers to God's, God's chosen, the elect, the set apart people. And you see in verse 2, and making the Lord our only good does not, in, does not imply becoming a monk in solitary confinement. This is exactly what he's saying. And rather is to put God as the center of everything, including our relationships. And David is saying, and his point is, his joy, he's saying, my joy in God is increased because I have delighted myself in the company of God's people. You see the translation is, I have more joy when, I, when, when, I, when I'm in, a, uh, in the company of my brothers and sisters. And he calls them saints and glorious ones. And 
the, 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 the idea of David is the path of lasting joy and pleasure, I can find it in the company of God's people, company of people that God has chosen. Friends, we travel in, in the company of fellow brothers and sisters and going in holiness and love as together we find joy. The Christian life, it's not a solitary journey. The Christian life is a life that we go and then we celebrate God's goodness together. We encourage one another. We encourage one another to grow and to, um, to, to uh, worship the Lord. It's exactly what David is saying here. And he said, make the Lord your supreme good by making, the, the verse one, by making him your refuge and savior, one, and by making him your Lord and supreme good, two, and by making him the center of your relationships. And David starts about God's sense, cause him to reflect on those who turn their back on God and pursue idols in verse four. In verse 4, we read, The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour, uh, pour out the, dr the drink of blood or take up their names on my lips. And the evil verb here can be translated either to run after someone or to acquire as a wife. In the idea in Exodus chapter 22, verse 16. So unfaithfulness to God is, com is, uh, is often compared to unfaithfulness in marriage. And Yahweh is portrayed as a, uh, as a husband to Israel, and the unfaithful wife was in Israel chasing after foreign gods. So either way, the idea is that uh, they have forsaken the living and true God to go after, after, after idols. But David is saying, those idols cannot bring us joy and pleasure. And those idols never provide fullness of joy, but rather multiplied sorrows. And that's always the case. Even for us today, we pursue the idols of this world the false god of uh, financial success, sensual pleasure, or personal peace, those things always promise fulfillment, but the result is sorrow, and sorrow after sorrow. And David is saying, to make the Lord the exclusive object of your worship, and put the Lord first, and that's he is, uh, that is he is saying in verse, in verse 4. In verses 5 and 6, Lord, you are my portion and my cup, and you make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. In the same way, Paul says that in Christ we have obtained an inheritance in, verse, in, in Ephesians 1, verse 1. And that in the ages to come, God will show us the surpassing riches, riches of his grace in kindness toward Christ in Christ Jesus. And you know, it will take all eternity to discover our inheritance. And that's beautiful. And Paul even says, God sealed that with the Holy Spirit. We have that guarantee that we have this inheritance in heaven. And the proof of that is the Holy Spirit will live in us. And what's the idea behind verses 5 and 6? And what was David thinking by writing those verses? And it was God's dividing the land to the 12 tribes of Israel, of Israel we remember back in, 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 in Numbers. And, but God did not give 
an inheritance of land to the priestly tribe of Levi. Follow with me very carefully. God, he divided the land, but he did not give any land to the, the, the priestly tribe of Levi. But rather, the, the Lord said to Aaron in Numbers 18, verse 20, you can look at it after Numbers 18, verse 20, he said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land, nor on any portion of, among them. But I am your portion and your in inheritance among the sons of Israel. And what the Lord is saying is, don't worry, I am your own inheritance. And as David reflects on this, his thought is that having the Lord as his portion is better than the best piece of land that anyone could inherit. So powerful. David is saying, you know, instead of having that piece of land, I'd rather have the Lord himself as my inheritance. And he, say, and he said, Yahweh is sufficient to, to meet all my needs. In verse 5, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. And C.S. Lewis wrote, He who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. You can have God with everything, but the one who has God only is more powerful than all the, the, the one that has everything and God. So wonderful. So David's primary joy is not God, is, is, is not in God's gift. It's not what the Lord has blessed him. David's primary joy is in, the, in God himself. He delights himself in God. See the difference. He's not rejoicing in what the Lord has given him, but he re is rejoicing in the Lord himself. Friends, can you truly say, I have made the Lord my highest treasure? Not in his blessings, because his blessings are good. But when you think delight in God himself, you will be more joyful. And you make that choice when you trust God as your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but then you should be going to treasure him more and more as you walk with him. And what happens when the Holy Spirit of God enables you to do this? You see, and we will have the second part of the, of the psalm. He will satisfy you with full joy and eternal pleasure. And in verse 7, David is saying in the psalm, when you make the Lord your highest treasure, you enjoy his counsel and instruction. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel, who has advised me, Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. And the Hebrew word here for mind, you, could, you will probably see in some translations, you have mind and you have heart. In the ancient world, and the, the seat of, uh, to express emotions um, in, in, the, um, in the kidneys, uh, it's the, 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 super, the super seat of emotion and thought, and they usually um, use the word kidneys, literally kidneys, or and here uh, we translate it as heart or, or mind. But it refers to innermost personal life. And uh, we have another word, a night, and the Hebrew is plural. Uh, so the, the thought of this verse is, uh, we can translate it as night after night, the Lord has counseled me and instructed me as I have meditated upon him, night after night. 
And David may be referring to the night to to the night he watches or to times when he woke when we, he woke up in the night and thought about the Lord. And he's probably thinking about that and when he cannot sleep, but he finds his, uh, his treasure in, in, in God's word. So when you treasure God's word in your heart, you receive his instruction, exactly what David is, is saying. He, you receive his, his, his instruction and counsel that will sustain you during nights of difficulty and trials. Let's go to verse 8. I have said the Lord always before you, before me. This is a very interesting one. David is saying, I have said the Lord always before me. So everywhere I go, I have said the Lord before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. When the Lord is your highest treasure, you experience his stability in trials. He said, I have set the Lord before me. And your responsibility to, is to set the Lord continually before you. In Paul's word, in, in Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. When you do that, and you have the result in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, you can mark it down. You have the result, the steadfast, the steadfast, the steadfast mind, the steadfast of mind. Isaiah said, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So when you know that the Lord is at your right hand, even though you may be surrounded by powerful enemies, you will have the peace of knowing that they cannot touch you unless it's, not, it's God's will. And John Calvin explains the meaning of this verse, the meaning of verse 8, is that David kept his mind so intently fixed upon the providence of God as to be fully persuaded that whenever any difficulties or distress should happen to him, God would be always at hand to assist him. And he says, he concludes, he concludes to say, David then considers himself safe from all dangers and promises himself certain safely because with the eyes of faith, he sees God as present with him. He sees God as the, God is, uh, is seated as his right hand. And he said in verse 9, Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh or my body also will rest secure. You probably have another word, my tongue. You will see my tongue in some translations you have my glory, but it's, it has been translated as uh, the glory of the frame and the instrument of praising God. And, uh, and you, you see also the, the body and some translations you have flesh. So glory refers to the soul. And uh, by adding the very interesting thing, by you have the tongue that David is praising with his tongue and, and, and you have the flesh. So by adding the flesh, David, David means that his total being inward and outward is glad and joyful because God has caused him to live securely. So when you reflect on, on your security, as Paul does in Romans 8, you can help but be glad and rejoice in the Lord. If God is your treasure, then you are his treasure. And God never loses his treasure. Think about that. God never loses his treasure. So rejoice. Because you are God's treasure. Verses 10 and 11. 
Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your holy ones to decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And you will see, we'll see later, and those verses, these verses find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But as applied to David, the idea is either that the Lord will preserve and prolong his life, or although he will die, the Lord will not permit him to suffer eternal destruction. And also by walking in the path of life, David had hope beyond the grave that he would enjoy full joy and eternal pleasure in God's presence. It's very interesting. He said, even I die, but I will rejoice in the Lord. He will give me full joy and eternal pleasure in his presence. And that's your hope, friends. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your highest treasure. And David's satisfaction is seen in verse 11. You see, it contrasts sharply with the sad experience of, of his son Solomon. Remember his son Solomon? Solomon sought satisfaction in his work, but found it empty. He sought fulfillment through wisdom, but found it vain. He built a beautiful palace and landscaped it and landscaped it with a fab fabulous garden, but found no pleasure in it. Solomon tried laughter and wine, but found this to be madness. He had sexual pleasures with 700 beautiful wives and 300 concubines, but they could not satisfy him. He had fabulous wealth, but it couldn't buy him happiness. He, co he chronicles all of this in Ecclesiastes. Although he finally found contentment in the Lord, he should have learned sooner from his father to make the Lord the highest, his highest treasure. And maybe you are wondering, how can I know that I will have joy and pleasure forever with God beyond the grave? Both Peter and Paul in Acts chapter 2, they mention, decide Psalm 16 and argue that verse 10 did not find final fulfillment in David in, die, in that he died and his body decayed. And David wrote prophetically of his son, God's, God's Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And after citing Psalm 16, Peter concludes, Brethren, I may confidently say to you, regarding the, part of the patriarch David, that he both died and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants of his, on his throne, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did he see the, 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 his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. And Paul explains, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ, Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And Paul also explains in 1 Corinthians, the entire Christian faith rests on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If his body is in the tomb and underwent decay, then we are not forgiven. But Paul and Peter and many other faithful witnesses joyfully testify that God did not leave Jesus in the tomb. And that means that God's promises of eternal joy and pleasure in his presence are secure for those who trust in the risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we sing, one with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. 
My life is hid with Christ on I, with Christ, my Savior and my God. Let me conclude with this. The, devil, the devil's original temptation to Eve suggested that God was withholding something good from, by forbidding Adam and Eve from eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The temptation also suggested that the first couple would find true satisfaction by sinning. The devil has used that same strategy again and again to say God is opposed to your enjoyment of life. And following God is gloomy. Sin will bring you true pleasure. Let me tell you, the truth of the Bible is sin may bring short-term pleasure, but it always brings long-term misery and pain. Submitting to God may bring short-term difficulty and pain, but it always results in lasting joy and pleasure. And so the core of the Christian life is to seek lasting joy and pleasure in God. And the familiar Westminster Shorter Catechism begins, and what is the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. The theologian John Piper thought, has thoughtfully improved on that by changing it to say, the chief of men is to glorify God by enjoying him forever. Not in enjoying him forever, but by enjoying him forever. Because God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our greatest, highest treasure. Let us always put Jesus first in our lives, in everything we do, to worship him as the only object of our worship. We pray that we keep him in our heart, we treasure him now and forevermore. In his name we pray, amen. Turn in your hymn books or look up and uh, 